And here we go, the Downward Facing Spiritual Spiral Podcast. My name, of course, is Eddie Cohn, host, creator of The Spiritual Spiral. Wonderful conversation in store for you today. I'm laughing a little bit just because you can kind of hear a bird chirping in the background, which, of course, is just symbolic because my guest today, Alethea Austin, she absolutely loves the outdoors, loves nature. So, of course, birds are here chirping outside the studio. And yeah, I'm just, I'm really stoked you're here today. Great conversation, inspiring, uplifting, energetic talk. I actually shed a tear at the end of, at the, end of the conversation with Alethea. So I think you're really going to enjoy the talk that I had with Alethea. Yep, here comes my cat also. It's just birds and cats here in the studio today. So really brief intro. Alethea, by the way, Alethea, I met maybe like 15 years ago at a music conference in maybe Oxnard or, or um, Santa Barbara, but she, over the last 10 years, even longer, has transformed her life into becoming a yoga teacher, but also a skydive coach. And she's the creator of these camps known as LSD camps. And I want to read something very briefly to you, just so you have a little bit of an understanding here of what LSD stands for and what the camps are. But after having great success in Europe over the last four years, the LSD skills camps, which stands for level slot dock, I guess those are positions that skydivers uh, take in the air. The LSD camps have made their way to the United States, landing at Skydive Spaceland in Houston. LSD camps are designed for jumpers who want, to prog- who want to progress their big wave vertical skydiving or group angle flying skills. And so Alethea is the creator of these camps. And so I thought it'd be incredible just to see her again and talk to her about what she's up to. But I was thinking about a couple of things. You know, you, you've probably heard over the years, or at least the last 18 months through my podcast, that I have some anxiety issues. And I'm also intrigued by this idea of energy. You know, I'm realizing over the last few years that I need, and I don't mean this in a clingy or needy sort of way, but I thrive when I'm around other people. I prefer conversations to texts. I prefer talking and seeing people as opposed to texting or sending DMs. And I realize that obviously I have to send texts. I do send them, I send emails, but, you know, what is happening to us as human beings, the more reliant we become on technology? So, and that's something that I'm intrigued by, you know, what does that mean to the creative landscape of the world, to human beings in general, when we're not talking, but we're, we're texting all day? And I was just, you know, I want, I want you to think about something really quickly. When you go out to dinner with people, Are you asking questions or are you just talking about yourself? Are you staring at your phone while you're at dinner or are you actually listening and engaged in the conversation? I mean, this podcast has sort of reminded me the value of face-to-face conversations and how important it is for me to thrive and evolve and become a a deeper human being, a more understanding human being. I need human-to-human contact. So I wanted to speak to Alethea sort of about that. And also, I've always been impressed with people that take chances, that just will willingly jump out of an airplane. I mean, I can't imagine jumping out of an airplane. I can't imagine getting to that place where you are just willing to let go and just jump out of a plane. And I, to me, that is an incredible personality trait that I don't think I've ever really possessed, but I'm really intrigued by those types of people that are able to do that kind of thing. I think, wow, just like hats off to Alethea and really this energy that she possesses and shares with her students, with me, with her friends. I just, the, the conversation is, as I was editing it and just listening back, it was just, I felt energized. And I think the world right now is obviously very chaotic and strange and difficult to comprehend, but I think it's more important now than ever to surround yourselves with people that fill you up, 
that listen, that ask you questions, that make you want to ask them questions, that bring curiosity and adventure to your life. So I just felt the timing to speak with Alethea was was just fantastic right now. So it's a great talk. We talk about yoga. We talk about these LSD camps. We talk about energy. We also talk about death and anxiety. I just, I think it's a really important talk. So thanks so much to Alethea for taking the time to talk to me. It was amazing seeing you. You can find her on Instagram at Alethea. I know Leo. Leo wants to say hi. (laughs) I know. So if you want to find out more about Alethea and these LSD camps, you can find her on Instagram at Alethea and then J-A. And of course, you can find me Instagram at Eddie Cohn, Twitter, IamEddieCohn.com. I've released a bunch of new music the last couple months, music videos. You can find me on Bandcamp. All the info will be in the notes of this podcast. Please reach out, say hi. You know, it's also really, really helpful if you share the show with your friends. Head over to iTunes and give it a review. About 55 million podcasts in the world. So if you think a friend of yours would dig this episode, please share it with your friends. So that's it. As always, thank you so much for listening, supporting, and being a part of the Downward Facing Spiritual Spiral podcast. Good to see you. Great to see you too. Yeah. Wow. It's been a minute, huh? It's been a while. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Where Where are you now? I'm in Portland okay. right now. Well, actually, Vancouver, which is across the bridge from Portland. Okay. Um, where I'm living, and uh, just got back. I think maybe four days ago or so. Yeah. And uh, yeah, this is my new home in the U.S. Wow. Yeah. Where are you at? Hold on, I think I hear my, yep, I hear my cat scratching. Hold on. <laughs> no worries, I'm gonna try to connect my uh, my headphones. Do it. We're still in LA. Um, sorry again about postponing this. This I, I'm finally like, I'm finally out of a boot and I'm able to kind of like walk again. So we had to postpone our trip to Austin um, yeah, and then we we were going to go the week, and they had like the ice storm of the century. Oh my gosh! Totally. <laughs> so we had totally. to post we had to postpone it again. So we're finally going like next week. Oh, I'm so happy for you. God, <laughs> I know it's like what's the world trying to tell us? It's nuts. <laughs> yeah, exactly. How else can we hold them down? <laughs> Holy moly! And is your your leg okay? Oh, yeah, I think. um, Oh, I'm sorry. I feel like I said, oh, really loud. Um, Yes, it's just I I broke it and tore like ligaments in the ankle. So the break actually healed in about a month. But apparently the ligaments and the tendons take like uh, much longer to heal. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So, Bummer. And I, I was playing the dangerous sport of Frisbee. So. Yeah. Got to watch out for that. Screen Frisbee. <laughs> Scary. <laughs> I feel like if, if I'm not careful here, I could just like sit around and laugh. So I need to make sure that I have a little. You, you know. Make sure your sneezing technique is really gentle. You know, you never know what could go wrong. You know, it's so <laughs> funny though. Like I. I you know, I have my own vetting process, but I typed in your name and I was reminded that I actually reached out to talk to you because I wanted to talk to the pole dancer. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're often mis- uh, we're often confused a little bit. <laughs> like all the all these memories that I have of you, it's like I'm brought back like the bananas, the, the, the bananas. The- <laughs> I was just telling my partner that story. <laughs> Sorry, but it's one of like, it's a really classic, hilarious story. And, uh, you know, as a man, I, I think he could understand being in a, a woman's house with, you know, your girlfriend as well. And just being like, um, okay, so there's a, there's one entire trash bin I'm going to fill with banana pills today. And this, I would much rather be under a rock hiding. <laughs> yes. 
Of course, I get like awful food poisoning the day before we come to stay at your place. And I remember going out to dinner and I'm like, I don't care where we go as long as there's rice. Yeah, I remember that too. Exactly. I remember that. That's amazing. Oh gosh. So good. You know, one thing I've I was it's weird. I had this friend that I used to work with who just like packed up her bags years yeah. years ago and just like moved to Kenya. And she's cool. been she's been living there ever since. And I feel like one thing that I've always been in awe of with certain people, and you're obviously at the top of the list, because I'm not, mm-hmm. I have a hard time with these kind of things. Like, I, I, I'm i all for trying things and, uh, you know, trying a podcast and writing a book, which I just, you know, I do all these things. But there's something about, like, that adventurous spirit that I have a hard time with. And I, yeah. I, I, I don't know. It's something that I feel like you've possessed for a long time. Or I, is, do you remember like having that attitude or energy from like the age of three? Or is it something that you sort of like picked up as you got older? Um, I don't really like a, there was a, I don't remember being a kid. I know some people that say like. I had this yearning from when I was two years old. I'm like, wow, that's amazing. I don't even remember life before probably, you know, maybe a memory here and there. So no, but I do definitely remember like, you know, I moved away from the small town that I grew up in when I was 17 and nobody in my family had done that. And I just kind of like took 150 bucks and said, I want to build a different life. And that was the beginning of my journey and this kind of developed sense of adventure or just like, looking to live as big as I possibly can in the ways that, you know, determine big for me. Yeah. Um, so that was definitely like something inside of me from early on for sure. But I'd say probably more developmentally around the teenage years, maybe. It's weird. Like I was thinking about, I do all this stuff mm-hmm. and I wonder like, at what point I, do we do? And you're obviously doing a lot of different kind of things, but is it, to get recognition or get joy or, I mean, a combination or you just want to, like, I feel like I want to get as much done creatively as I can because I know my time is limited here. And I I do all these things because I love them. But I also, when I finish a song or something, I I want people to hear, you know, hear it. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know, like, do you... Does this make any sense to you or do you know what I'm asking? I don't know, do you... Um, I don't think I resonate with wanting people to know my stuff or feel, see it or experience it. Like I don't use people as my radar of, of like a success or a completion of something. Um, so maybe we differ in that way a little bit, but on the other hand, I'm not creating anything other than my life. Right. Um, but I, you know, what yearns me and what has for a really long time is just to like live as big as possible. Right. And so as big as possible for me has been to like, follow whatever sort of passions are inside and they're pretty evident to me like I get pretty strong signals of myself saying like this feels good Hmm. pursue that go with this um and that's all to satisfy that like that ticking clock that's gonna you know finish my story at some point and just to satisfy the space in between this moment now and the the finale of this Alethea life. Yeah. Um, and it, it kind of like a comes out in, it was like, it's manifested in me moving around the world and me, you know, um, having all of these big experiences and, and diving into myself. That's how it comes out for me. Yeah. You look yeah. great. You look great by the way, and really strong Thanks. and look like really strong. Oh yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, I, I crossed over the forties and, uh, (laughs) and, um, I've always had some kind of like, you know, I've been plant-based for 24 years now. So that actually now you can see the, you can see my diet, my whole life actually in my body now, you know, Mm. like at, at a 40 plus woman, like the diet choices that I've made are present in my body. Yeah. And then on top of that, there's always been yoga or running or muscle, you know, like building and whatnot. And a little bit more in the last maybe five years because my career is a body driven career. So it's 
if I'm not taking care of this thing, then, you know, like what it, yeah. how am I expecting to get any sort of longevity in that? Well, it's funny because that was sort of leading to sort of an area that I wanted to chat about. But, you know, and I don't want to talk about like societal stuff going on, but I, you know, I got really sick as a kid and um, I got rheumatoid arthritis when I was 12 and there was like a year when nobody knew what was wrong. And it does feel like we live in this world where, you know, people just sort of like people, whoever they may be, just want you to take like a pill, you know, to fix your problems or like, um, yeah. I'll just use that as an example. Yeah. Um, and I just, you know, I, again, I'm obviously over 40 now and, and I, I learned probably in my mid twenties how important it is to eat well and exercise every day. Good. And it just feels like, because, you know, if, if you are going to jump out of an airplane or, you know, be, be on the road or, you know, write and, and do all these cool things that we want to do, you need to be, you know, active and, and resilient. And yeah. it just feels yeah. like um, those are discussions that sort of the, um, the, 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 the speakers in the world don't really want to talk about or don't, you know, suggest. Glaze over for sure. Yeah. And, you know, like, like a couple things there is that it's, it's for the, the, the ability to do like these athletic things, you know, and for me, which is translating into, you know, being able to, you know, um, fly my body on a high level and, uh, and at the rate that I do with the amount of, of, uh, of uh, jumps that I make, but then also in the wind tunnel and then also yoga. Um, but then there's the, like the micro pieces of that, which is just like, Get, loving yourself and feeling really good in your body and feeling happy and the like the sort of like dynamic energy that like having a positive lifestyle creates your your spirit is light your energy is high you have you know you don't have anything hanging over you in terms of like energy um so there's that like day to day as well that we just don't even really talk about i think like f food and and uh, self-care and mental care and emotional care. Those things are totally like you say, just kind of take a pill or stuff it away or don't deal with it until it's a really big situation or um, uh, uh, like illness. And then we'll put you on the things. And it's, it's really a shame because if, as you know, you started in your 20s, I started around 18 or 19, somewhere around there too. And then my whole life from that point has just been like, whoo, this is a party. Yeah. This feels really good. I feel amazing, you know, and everything sort of rolls off of that. Because if you wake up in this vessel, um, how that feels already from the beginning of your morning is sort of how your day is going to be processed, right? Yeah. If you wake up and you feel strong and you feel light and you feel healthy and you love yourself and your conversation and your head is really positive because you're showing yourself that you love you yourself by the food that you're eating and how you're treating your body and your mind and your heart, then your day is already great. Cause you're, you're in that sort of like lens, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's so super important. It's so entirely massively huge, you know? And I don't think we talk about that. I think people look for the big things, you know, a, like a, a diet or a, what the scale says, which is totally bizarre, you know? Right. Um, and, well, well, like, you know, I'm so grateful and I feel super lucky that something switched for me. You know, it's not that I did it by magic. It's that something switched in me. So that's, I feel super grateful for that. I struggle with that sometimes, you know, when I, I broke my ankle and I, I do know, I think it's because, I mean, I, I know 99% sure when I got sick, when I was 12, it didn't go away until I was like 17. Um, yeah. and this was way before a lot of these medications. I mean, I've been off meds for 20 years, but I think when something goes wrong, I feel like, am I ever going to get better? You know, like those first few weeks I got really depressed 
because I, I mean, I'm so active and I, I'm doing like hill sprints and riding my bike and I couldn't do anything. And I remember, you know, your email about, you know, trying to enjoy the down, the downtime, but it's weird in, in those downtimes, I can sort of like, I can spiral and think like, God, this, this might not ever get better. And, 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 but it's funny now that I can walk, I, I'm, I'm sort of like, I'm just like, a, everything is so awesome right now. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's always easier said than done for something like that when an injury has stopped you from even just the basic thing of like being able to maybe pull up your shorts, you know, because yes. you're, you've got a cast on or something, those small things. And I know having, you know, very super minor injuries, a dislocated elbow and some sprained ankles and stuff like that along the along the path. Um, you know, it's, it's very much a test of like how much work you've put into your, your mind in those moments, you know, because I'm pretty gosh darn positive, pretty much most of my life. And I, and I pride myself on that and I work really hard. And if it starts to get a little bit foggy in that, in that sense, then I try really hard to make sure I'm cleaning it all up and like still able to take in the, the inputs of the world as difficult as they can be at some times and recycle them with like, ah, this is, this is part of the game. Um, but you know, when you are injured and you're not able to do your normal things, it's so much a test of that. And you know, it's really, it's really hard, even if it's something simple as like a sprained ankle, you know, like that can put you down for several weeks and it's the rest of your body is like, I'm able to do all these things. Why is it down to just this little part of my body? Yeah. So I fully get it. You know, I think everybody faces that for sure. And um, those, those, those are always a good moment to be um, aware of like how lucky we are that, you know, aside from these injuries once in a while, we actually don't even have to think about our body doing all of this incredible stuff. Yeah. And we can just on a whim go bang out five mile run if we want to 10 mile most likely and, you know, oh, somebody now wants to go stand up paddle boarding. Awesome, I'm in. Or sure, I'll go surf in Mexico. Why not? Or a 13-mile hike up a mountain? Great. But, you know, like that goes without even any thought to it. And that's, woo, that is so entirely lucky. Like, hold, get down on your knees and just thank everything because that's not, this, that's not the case for a lot of people due to – things that happened along the way due to, you know, birth, due to age, whatever it is. Right. Yeah. So it's these little moments are a good, are a good moment to sort of recognize how, how much we move through our day without even knowing or thinking the capacity of our body's movement Yeah. on a day to day basis. I want to, um, I'm thinking just sort of the energy in the world of distractions and tech, but I, I before I even go there, I just, I want to know like what, do you do you do you run or own a skydiving camp or just tell me what you're doing right now and then I want to backtrack a bit and be like when did you jump out do you remember that first time but I just so what are you doing right now give me the details yeah so about a year and a half ago I guess um no it was this time last year this time last year I was traveling through India for it was like a month and a half um I just said goodbye to this a five-year contract I had managing the um, the marketing for three drop zones, which are skydiving centers. Um, and uh, I decided that I was going to go uh, independent uh, coaching skydiving, but not like new students, people that just say, hey, I want to try to learn skydiving. I'm, I'm actually coaching people that have lots and lots of jumps and they're already um, a, a, a decent level or a very good level. And I'm helping to get them a little bit further in that. So I'm working with experienced people. So I decided to go uh, full time, just uh, coaching. And before that, with the events, which which you probably saw online, um, I created five years ago these events called the LSD uh, skydiving events. LSD stands for Level Slot Dock, which are skydiving terms um, that we apply to like being able to build really big formations mm -hmm. um, and just sort of like some of the fundamentals of a safe uh, group flying. So I created these events called LSD. I've been running them for five years, um, about six to eight per year. They're always sold out. They're international. People are flying from everywhere. And they're really, really fun. And they're work camps. You know, like skydiving is pretty much a group of people around the world who are like, 
I don't know what society is doing. That shit looks weird. So I'm just going to go ahead and dip into this, uh, this uh, sub world of really free thinking people who have these deep connections. And I'm going to build this life in this super, super sub world that's based about based on freedom and connection and trust Hmm. and pushing through fears. And it's really, really cool. It's probably one of the greater decisions I've made in my life. So, kind of building that event into this world and it's just been super super fun um the events have gone really well yeah i'm still running them now they started out as head down formation so kind of like when you see the people like you know these are their legs and the head is going down Mm -hmm. um to angle flying which is a more um a, a, a newer discipline in the sport um and kind of like all of the rave right now but it's it's also really beautiful because we're picking up and we're we're really moving around the sky and and uh, super beautiful. So now I have two versions of those camps, LSD, big way formations, the head down and then the, the movement. And it's a ball. I love it. Wow. It's weird. Like, at what point when you're skydiving, does one get to that place where you're like, you know, I can improve this? Like, to me, it's sort of like, it makes sense that I want to get better at golf. You know, I want my lower, yeah. lower number. So, how, yeah. it, it, you know, where do you, like, Give me some details or like, how do you fine tune and get better yeah. at that? Yeah. Well, I think everybody, you know, like the general public would probably connect with the idea that like, um, that skydiving is just belly to earth flying down. Right. That's what you see in tandems and like kind of the old school, you know, like, a like, you know, they're, they're skydiving and they're just like arched and they're like, this is really sick, you know, and they, in the, in the movies and TV, it's really like that kind of edgy person who's just living off of adrenaline and, you know, no helmet and hair flying everywhere and you know like a patrick swayze you know <laughs> whomever so that's like kind of like that's where scattering started was belly to earth um flat flying basically and um and then uh, we got into this free flying and free flying is being able to instead of go belly to earth um you know head down angles flying up like this like anything you name it it's dynamic you're you're actually pushing against the wind to be able to fly your entire body upright, you know, moving across the sky with your head up like this, you know, coming back under your feet. Like it's very dynamic and really, really fun. But to be able to get to that level, um, you have to train, train like an athlete. I mean, like very, very much train. Um, that doesn't come easy to be able to fly like this does not come easy, easily at all. It's, it's, uh, it's, um, it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of training. It takes a lot of mental power to be able to think about these lines and what it's going to feel like up there and where you should be pushing, what pressure goes where, where you should be looking, what your feet should be doing. And, you know, like your entire body pressed up against the wind can make a difference. Your hand can make a difference because you're going so fast and you've, depending on what you know, what, what body position you're in belly to earth is the slowest, you know, aside from the wingsuits, but I won't even discuss that because that's a totally different breed, but belly to earth is really slow because it's your whole body up against the wind. And so when you're pretty vertical, you're really, really fast. Right. So, you know, body position matters so much. If your chin is here or here makes a big difference. Um, so I think for me, that moment was kind of like, Ooh, this is really fun. And it was never adrenaline for me. It was really like, I lived in LA. Um, I worked at a plastic surgeon's office managing his office. I think I was like 22. Um, you know, just getting shit done on my own. I didn't come from money. I left home with that $150, just trying to make shit work in LA and, uh, was a little bit I won't say lost because I've always had myself. I've never felt lost. I'm, I've always been a friend to me. So I've always had me, but I was definitely like, whoa, this is a pretty trippy city. You know, where does, where does this like very, very small town girl with very, very small town impressions kind of like, how do I process this city with this transient feeling and this Hollywood thing and like people with lots of money and, you know, uh, this whole thing that I was just totally new to me. And uh, I had remembered this thought that I had had years ago about skydiving. And it was like in the middle of the afternoon, it was like, ah, I had wanted to make a skydive one time. Why don't I do that? So I remember looking up a place and then I made a jump. And then those jumps were I would just go by myself up there 
And I'd be like giddy on the plane, you know, have some happy tears on the way up and like hold my heart and think about how grateful I was to be alive. And, you know, and it became this like inventory check. Do the people that I know, you know, that, that I love, do they know that I love them? Have I been a good human? If I die right now, is everything going to be okay? Like, would I die with peace? And so it was kind of cool to have those moments because nothing else really ever made me think like that. Yeah. But then once I moved to uh, to Europe, it went from like every once in a while skydive to like, oh my God, there's like, wow, I could actually go far in terms of my own flying skills. Like, whoa, there is there's some things to to do in this sport. And so then I started, you know, I started to want to be get, to be good and looking at people that were way ahead of me, like, whoa, I want to do that. Oh, cool. And to do that took, you know, aside from money and time and energy, it took training, like working with incredible coaches and training and showing up and going all around the world to fly with these incredible coaches and um, having goals, you know, and, and working towards it. And uh, that's probably, like I say, that sub world we spoke about, about mm-hmm. how freaking incredible the, the, the community is and how strong it is and inclusive it is. That's a really big drop, huge drop. It's like, it's like walking into a new place and everybody, they see you and they get you, you know, like that's nice, right? Yeah. You're just kind of like, I, yeah, I see you. I, I get you. That That's pretty cool um, to get that in strangers. So the, the, the community is awesome. But there's never going to be a point in this sport where anyone has ever made it. Like mm. you can't get to the top of what you can do when you're flying your body. And that is so badass. Like how great is that? Yeah. The moment that I get to the place I've been working on, it, that, 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 that finish line has moved so much further ahead. And like, that is really cool. That keeps me fresh. It keeps me learning and training. And it's just like, so exciting, right? Like yeah. there's something, these, these goals and like, it keeps you just, wow. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's really thrilling. It's really fulfilling as well. You know what I was thinking, and I think it's part of sort of my navigating, you know, the world that we live in, uh, in tech and friendships and and sort of the chaos of the world. I I feel like your sport and what you're talking about, and again, I'll I'll just use the analogy of like writing a book. You know, I, I spent almost three years and I finally found a publisher and I'm working with an editor now, but the amount of like focus and and detail to attention and not being distracted i mean i'm sure that's all just amplified when you're jumping out of a plane i mean Mm -hmm. like to talk to me sort of about that trust that you're because again i think all these distractions and tech and you know you always have had this sort of really trustworthy energy about you i mean we know we knew each other a little bit but you allowed my girlfriend and i to stay at your place and you know i don't know you just and I'm sure you have to feel that when you're with these people and meeting them and jumping out of the plane and trying these new things. It, and it feels like to get to that place, you can't even think about the fear of jumping out of a plane. I mean, you've obviously moved way past that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the trust thing thinks, by the way, that was a sweet thing to, sing, to say. Um, the trust took 100%. 100%. Like, if... If at this point in my life, there's one thing I can say, it's that the world has looked out for me. And mm. I know how gr- how grateful, you know, uh, that I should be and that I actually re- very much am. Um, but also, you know, like anytime there's any sort of like, oh, you know, like this is a little bit of a, a scary point, maybe financially or like, you know, the world or whatever it is, whatever my fears might, you know, come in through life in certain moments. It's like, ah, I'm okay. The world has taught me that it's it's always going to be okay. It's going to be okay. So that trust sort of emanates into everything else, I think. Yeah. Um, and particularly with skydiving, the 
the trust for sure. Absolutely. The being having to early on when fear was a big thing, push beyond the fear in order to jump out of the plane. Like it would be there guarding the door. Like you will die. You're going to lose, you know, your legs. You're going to all of these terrible things. And it would be right there in the door. And I would have to push past that in order to do this thing that I love. And so that taught me about facing fears and moving beyond them and having reasonable reactions to them and then being able to breathe through them. So that's a really, really good lesson to have and something that it feels like I've come very far with, which is awesome. Um, uh, and, you know, it's not to say that there aren't moments that I'm pretty nervous if it's a you know, I'm, I'm leading people at a, a new drop zone that's a little bit sketchy and, you know, the risks are a little bit more elevated and well, I very, very much have what, to be. Sorry, what does that know, mean? Like what would be sketchy or what would be an added risk? It would be like, um, say, where we would normally land um, at the drop zone, maybe around the drop zone are all buildings and telephone wires and trees. And there's no way that you can be any anything less than absolutely accurate to where you take six of your students at mm. in order for them to be able to come back with all the weather to that landing area safely so that's like there's no room for error in some of those situations so moments like that where i'm like Whew, all right gotta be on my game today yeah. there are lives involved yeah. for sure right or maybe it's maybe it's we're doing a jump plan and i'm a fun jumper now i'm no longer wearing that coaching hat and you know, someone, I don't, they, I don't know if I trust them, you know, but I trust myself. So I know, you know, I give you, there's fear there sometimes with this sport for sure. And sometimes I'll just get on the plane and everything's going to be an easy jump and, you know, lovely. And, and I think I'm definitely going to die. Oh, because I have that thought means I'm probably going to die. Oh no, it's my whole life telling me this is the sign. And I just have to breathe through it because wow. your mind is very funny, right? It's, it's just a hilarious little feature that we have here of just this constant, like, can I get a reaction? Can I get a reaction? Mm. Well, it's, uh, it's funny. I was just thinking about, I was just saying to Emmy, like, you know, the, the Austin, Texas ice storm and everything, you know, it, it's weird. We live in this amplified reactionary world where like people be like, oh my God, you, don't move to Texas. Everything's broken. And sometimes it's like mother nature, just sometimes like weird shit happens and you know, everything's okay. But I think to your point, I sort of go to that place where, oh my God, I'm never going to walk again. And, and it's just, I get, yeah. I get, I don't, I get annoyed that I go there, but I, I know it's a natural thing, but it just feels like you kind of like it's almost like you're able to observe you going there and then you're like, okay, Alicia, I I'm here, but, but just don't take this too seriously. Yeah. I'm going to move. To yeah. The, I don't oh, know. for sure. Yeah. For sure. But it, but it's taken me years of like, you know, my biggest project, my most creative project in life is just knowing myself. And that's been like decades long of like actual roll up the sleeves. Let me see what's under the hood. Some of these parts are a little bit strange. Let me go ahead and clean these up or remove them and replace them. Like I have been doing a lot of work on knowing myself. And so like that didn't come easily, you know, so you have to put the work in to be able to have that separation to peel away from that thing and go like, ah, it's coming. Here it is. Okay. It's here. All right. Well, let me give it a little bit of energy so that it feels like it has that space to be able to do that thing. Like, all right, fear. Yes, maybe I'm going to become a paraplegic. Yes, maybe I'm going to die. Yep, I don't think I called my mom today and told her that I love her. Well, she's not going to go that I love her. Like you can do that. And, and also in the same breath, understand you're doing it and know that there's that it, it isn't you. So when I have those moments of whatever it is, frustration, right? I just interfaced with somebody that was, um, you know, a, 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 an abrasive person. And maybe that brought up that frustration to me, I can acknowledge it and kind of like be okay with that feeling, but definitely also give that a time limit hmm. of, you know, like I, 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 and I learned this like maybe 15 years ago when I was really scared and having those scary feelings on the airplane, I would, you know, I, at some point it just became a little bit too much. I was like, Whoa, this is overwhelming. I just might not even do this thing. I'm scared. What am I doing? Hurling my body out of a plane. This is crazy. Um, and then I actually looked at my altimeter and I gave myself 3,000 feet to freak the fuck out in my head. Yeah. And then at the end of the 3,000 feet, I would take a deep breath and then begin thinking about the jump. 
And so I actually apply that to like the feelings that I have, right? So if I'm down here and something's happened on the ground, I'm just, you know, ah, whatever emotion that is. And I'll just think, uh, all right, so you're upset. That's yes. Yeah, that is kind of a crappy thing. Yep, that, that, that blows, right? Okay, now it's time to reset. And for sure that's helpful, right? It's just helpful. Otherwise we become like this little like chained thing to this, that little, you know, voice inside of us that is really always looking for a reaction. And, uh, and we can get control of that. We can acknowledge it and, you know, have it live the same life with us because it actually doesn't ever go away. But we can all also like, it doesn't have to own us for sure. Yeah. Are you, are you scared or think about death very often or you don't? I am. Or? Yeah. Okay. I think it's mostly a fascination with it in the sense of, you know, not from my sport because it's, you know, like people are dying everywhere. Yeah. So it's not that it's like um, exclusive to the, you know, to, to, to my, my passion. But I think just, you know, crossing into the 40s has like, oh, all right. I wonder what it's going to be. Hmm. You know, like I, I definitely, I wouldn't call myself a morbid person, but death is definitely present in my life in terms of what I think about. I wonder about it, you know, and in this lifelong art, the project that I have of knowing myself, it's like, how, 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 you know, what is it to be, to, to lose the Alethea body what you know in my nobody knows actually nobody has any idea so nobody can actually even say but we can hypothesize about it what do I think about it is there is there a separation from my spirit my soul and my body does something go on like all of those things right yeah what does death mean for me what what does you know what what must I experience in this Alethea life right now before that happens you know is it going to be painful is it going to be scary like you know all of those things for sure I think about it very very much yeah but it's also kind of like I don't know any other way how to because it's every day is a day closer to that Hmm. And so, you know, I, I like I, I could kind of like plug my ears and close my eyes and be like, no, we're not going to die. We're not going to die. Blah. But I don't think that would serve me so much. I think knowing that it's there serves me in a way of just like, I want to feel, I want to live, I want to experience, I want people that I love to know that I love them. And I kind of want to burst out of my scenes and make sure that this is like a big life for me because that end is inevitable. Yeah, and are you? I see the cross in the background, but are you religious? Um, I wouldn't say I'm religious. No, I don't. I don't pick up any sort of like religious books or go yeah. to any uh, buildings that are like serving religion. But absolutely, without a doubt, there's something that I've had a, a lifelong relationship as well that I've been able to call on um, as clearly as black and white, day and day and night. But I just don't know what it is. You know, yeah. it's a it's a really big, loving, kind, beautiful energy. And, you know, I've had, I think we've spoken about this, quite some ayahuasca ceremonies and have like, you know, really felt this deeper connection to this thing that was already in my life before. And I would say I'm like faithful. Yeah. That's what it feels like. Yeah, I think that's something that I need to work on. You know, I, I feel like um I think I'm just, I'm scared of the body, you know, what's like it crumbling, you know, or, or I, I think that's why I started yoga and, and swim and, and, you know, hill sprints and, and just, I don't know, I'm trying to get, prepare myself as best I can, even though I, I can't prepare. It's weird. I guess this sort of goes to this issue of control also. And I, I'm very envious of your you know, the symbolism here of jumping out of a plane and, and it's, it's really just sort of like, it's strange. Like we do these things for our health, but as much as we do, really we're not in control, you know? Completely. It's, Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it's just something I struggle with a lot. And you have to keep, yeah, you gotta be like, I guess it's a matter of, um, you know, in some ways, I think like investigating what control feels like and what kind of like, is there like, is there any sort of is there any relationship that you have to control? 
you know, or, or, um, faith or trust. Like those are the kind of the things that come to me and come to mind with like, you know, um, it's very terrifying to really understand that there's no way out of that one thing. Like, Nope, you are, you are on that list and there is definitely no getting out of that one. That's that one commitment you cannot break. And that's terrifying for sure. But in that, if you think about it, is this process of um, getting to, uh, getting to sort of like be at peace with that. And that's a, that's a really big process. That is a loss of control. Whereas we have control in a lot of things in our not life, definitely not all of them. Um, so kind of uh, getting okay with a loss of, of control and then also having faith. Faith is a really big thing, like faith that it's going to be okay. Faith that, you know, in that moment, it actually might be something than what, you know, our scary mind is telling us. Um, faith that this was all, a, there was all a big purpose for this whole thing that might even continue into another sort of um uh, experience, you know, and then trust, just trusting in, in this whole process, just, just trust. So those are, you know, as you sort of like you grapple with those things for you, Eddie, personally, it's just kind of like, I know it's really terrifying and it's, it's very scary and, you know, but like, it's also kind of a nice signal to you of just like, Hey, there's some areas that maybe you haven't um, given some attention to, and maybe once you do, it won't be as terrifying too. Yeah. I think, you know, I grew up in a household that, um, anxiety was sort of like always there in the periphery, even before I got yeah. sick. And then when I got sick and yeah. I think it's sort of, it's something that I've dealt with for most of my life. And it's weird when I'm, when I'm listening to you talking and, and seeing you smile, it, it, it it's weird. You have this energy. It, I've realized I need people in my life. I don't want to detract too much or go down too much of a rabbit hole, but I guess I've realized like texting, of course I text. Um, of course I, I send email, you know, but I get this sense. I started a podcast because I need to talk to people and in this crazy busy world that we live in now, it is harder now more than ever to get people. And I even noticed this when I went out to dinner with friends, like their phone would be out. They'd sort of like be looking at their phone and kind of talking to me. And, and I, I don't say this with resentment, but I know that that subconsciously bothered me. And I felt like as an anxious person, you know, sure, I can text, but I like like hearing your voice and seeing you smile. Like I I think I need that kind of stuff in my life as much as I possibly can. Not just from like my people in my inner circle, but like the circle around them. Like this, I don't know. I don't even know what my point is. But I'm just realizing, as somebody who's dealt with anxiety, and and here you are talking about having faith and trust, and you jump out of the plane, and I can't imagine ever doing that. Yeah. I just I think it's really important to sort of figure out what we need to to yeah. feel um, a connection because as you said like we're all going to die and it's really scary and and I just from my experience I I've noticed that I I need relationships that aren't just like texting that are actually you know phone calls and talking yeah. totally absolutely uh, yes to all of that for sure hmm. you know um i've recently like um been uh, been uh, privy to to uh, a dear person in my life who who's been i think mostly through this uh process of having to stay home for about a year kind of developed a bit of anxiety with a you know a, a panic attack here and there uh to which she hadn't necessarily too much before although most of her inputs the people around her have anxiety as well like from her family uh, the way that we sort of deal with that or at least what i see in in the people that i know that do have anxiety and anxious tendencies um and from you know my friend who's dealing with it uh, fresh kind of as a new thing is it seems like we sort of sink back from it it's like we're anxious about this. So we like go backwards and we like put up these walls and it's like, well, this thing makes me anxious. So I'm going to remove it from my life. And, you know, and then what I'm going to do is like 
you know, maybe not for her case, but for people that I know, they take a pill. I think that you have a pill, like a prescription or something. I don't know what it is. You've got these things, right? Yeah. But it's like, and from my completely uneducated non-doctor background uh, as someone who doesn't suffer from anxiety. So basically my most ignorant background ever. I just don't think that's the way. I think that we're capable of, of building anxiety. I think we can create anxiety. I think that it's like a totally man-made thing for many people and for other people, it's, you know, probably something else. But, you know, had I nurtured that, those anxious feelings in the airplane that I was speaking about of, I will become a paraplegic or a quadriplegic, or I will break everything and be in a hospital for years, or I will die and it's going to be painful and excruciating and scary. Um, You know, all of those things. If I hadn't said, hold on, this has the potential of getting totally out of control unless I start to talk it down. Hmm. And, and that's what I did and I spoke it down until it became, I was up here and it was down here and it was still clattering away and shouting and looking for that attention that I would peer at it, acknowledge it, but still drive for myself. Yeah. Um, I think that that definitely could have kept me out of the sport. And I'll see it sometimes if people have a bad situation in the sport or an accident or something really scary happened. They're done. Like, done, done, done. Can't do it. Too much. I'm, I'm too scared now. And it's like, well... But that's not how we should be handling fear. We shouldn't be handling uncomfortable situations by leaving them. We shouldn't be handling fear by backing away from it. We should actually look into the face of these things and know more about them. Know more about what it is that makes you anxious and don't hide from it, but actually move forward into it. What's the story with yoga? How did you become interested in it? Because I know we both teach and um, it's weird. Like I I taught yoga or not taught. I started practicing yoga when I was like 23, 24 because my condition came back again. What's weird. I got sick again. I moved home back to Ohio in my early 20s. And I was like, I'm not staying in Ohio. I'm going to go back to L.A. because I loved it there. But I realized I'm going to have to put a few things into place to as much as health is physical and I I trust I have had the disease and I got sick. I know there was a lot of mental instability going on and my just just my perception of the world and handling anxiety. So I went to a therapist and started going to therapy regularly and then I started going to yoga. And by the time I was like 20, 29, um, I just was a completely new person, you know, and as I said, I still deal with these issues, but now I actually don't kill myself over it and I'm able to sort of, you know, get, get by more than get by, but you know, my point. So, but then I, it's weird. Like I became a yoga teacher for many reasons, but I, I don't know. I felt like I do feel like Instagram and the LA world and sort of the, the beauty Queens, the, the, the yogis and the, uh, the yoginis, it sort of became so superficial. And and I just was like, what what the fuck is going on here? Because my first yoga teacher in my 20s was, you yeah, know, there was no social media and Instagram at all. And, and it just, she was there because she loved to teach and she wanted to help. And I, I sort of like looked around and those types of teachers just didn't seem to be as, as represented. And so, I mean, I don't have like a huge following, but I can tell my students really love me and my classes. And it's really this awesome addition to my life. Um, Just sort of tell me a little bit about, I guess, the transition from not just being a student, but wanting to become a teacher and and how that's been a part of your life. Yeah, I am. I also found yoga in my 20s. Um, it was, a I forget the name of it, bridge something, I think in LA, um, there was a really cool golden bridge or something. Yeah, I think sure. LA was a totally different world. <laughs> uh, so I forget a lot of those references, but golden bridge. Yeah. 
and then Bikram. And I was really like this fair weather kind of uh, um, student, you know, going on a whim. And then also I'd go for months and be you know, very, very dedicated and then not go for months. Then, um, But it was really beautiful to have into my life because it was just a nice addition. I was running marathons at that time and I was a total gym rat. So I really found the the yoga to kind of give me that longer stretched out fully in my body kind of feeling um as opposed to the weights and just running in the shoulders and whatnot <laughs> so i really loved it um and uh when i moved to amsterdam i didn't know anybody and i lived as you know because you and uh, your partner uh visited me i lived above a, yo- a yoga studio And um, when I moved there, I had a couple uh, major losses in my life, and I didn't have any uh, support system there. Um, So I was really sort of like a a broken open and um, and just kind of healing by myself in that 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 loft that you guys visited me in. Mm -hmm. And so I started going to yoga and uh, I had no excuse. It was down down uh, down the, the stairs for me. And in the practices that I was uh, involved in, I just started like bawling in Shavasana, Mm. very quietly, but like a pretty solid stream of tears were coming out. And that's how I started to kind of rebuild from uh, uh, these uh, shattered moments. And so I became heavily like um, um, involved in it because it had become this new tool for me to deal with this this brokenness. and so I was there at every class every day. And then the studio moved a couple blocks down. And then I followed them to that studio just every day. And, you know, I always have always worked from home, essentially. So I was just build my work schedule around my yoga. And then, you know, years of doing this, the the owner said, hey, why don't you, I would love to put you on the schedule as a teacher. And I thought, well, that's so fraudulent because I haven't <laughs> studied yoga. I'm just slightly obsessed with it, you know. Right. And um so I actually did accept to, to teach one class a week, but I signed up for a, um, a teacher training course. And I found what you just touched on, which was um, sort of this inauthenticity, inauthenticity and kind of like a very much like 20 year olds, you know, with a, a yoga quote and um, not not connecting with any of the schools. So it took me a while to find a, an actual school that I really thought, okay, these people have experience, they live it, they breathe it, they know it, and it's not a show. It's not like, you know, a a scene or a fashion statement or anything. Yeah. yeah. But it was yin, and I'm very, very not a yin, you know, (laughs) person. I mean, I am in the the evening, and my, my life is very yin and super peaceful, but, like, my energy inside is very much like, let's go. And so, um, but I wanted the, the two teachers. I wanted them. I wanted to learn from them. I didn't care what discipline it was. So I studied in Yen um, and uh, took a couple of their teacher trainings, actually. And in, in, in the same time, I was still, you know, teaching at, at Suka Yoga in Amsterdam. And then I started um, really actually putting classes on their, their, their schedule. Uh, and that was really exciting for me because in, you know, being able to know myself now, I've, I've always very much been able to like engage with people. That's one of my, like, um, my Aletheia things is I can really get into somebody and pull them in. And if it's a big room, even better, I can get everybody involved and, you know, I, I, I can do that. And so when I would be on my mat with, you know, 40 people in a class, I could really have them there. And that was really awesome to do because it was an expression of art using my body and helping them. And then also an expression of my love and care for people by being able to touch them and adjust them. And then in meditation, like a very deeply wonderful one for me was to be able to feel something in the room, you know, as I'm seated in there in Shavasana and I'm just as strange as it sounds able to sort of, get some kind of something from somewhere about what I should lead in that meditation. And every time, you know, there would be someone who would cry and come up to me after and wrap their arms around me and say, Oh, I so needed that message today. So that was really checking all these boxes of things that I love and, and, and that, um, that are small talents of mine. Um, 
And then when I moved from Amsterdam to Spain, um, I was teaching uh, three or four mornings a week just for free for all of the, the people that uh, were in skydiving. And um, that was a steady group that came religiously, but then also a lot of people coming here and there. So the, um, the classes tended to be like, um, you know, uh, always with beginners in there. Um, but then always with these people that had been dedicated. So it was really uh, nice for me to kind of stay in yoga um, and be able to give it for free for five years. Hmm. Um, and uh, and I enjoyed that so much. I also became very desperate to be on the mat with somebody else uh, giving me a flow. So when I um, moved to the U.S. just this last year during COVID, it's been like such a joyous experience of showing up as a student and having someone else determine that flow for me and really beautiful. Yeah. Um, yoga is a really interesting thing because you definitely have, you know, if you go on Instagram, it's, you know, it's, it, it's, it's as if it's not spiritual or not a yoga pose. If you're not in a, 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 a you know, a, a really sexy um, bikini. And um, unfortunately that's like so far from, from any, you know beginning of yoga it's so so far like what what we've turned it into and what we think it says about us right if i if i put up a picture of yoga on instagram you know i i believe that it says that i'm all of these things and uh yeah it's weird like sorry i was just thinking i I struggle with a couple things and then i'll let you go but i was just thinking we have become so obsessed with numerical numbers, you know, it's like how many likes or how many views or how many streams or like, oh, the Rotten Tomatoes, it has like an 87. So I guess I'll see that movie that Quentin Tarantino put out. And, you know, I somehow like yoga is like sort of the complete like is everything okay? Sorry. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> my my partner looked at me and said, "Am I being too loud?" Because he's oh, no. actually cooking over there. I was like, "You're good." <laughs> yeah. More noise, the better. <laughs> he's got like he's like jamming away, making good. something. Like, he's yeah. like, "Oh." No, we're okay. um, yeah. I don't know. I just like to your point, and I, I it's weird. Like sometimes I get anxious. I've I've enjoyed making this new album so much. But then to sort of like put it out there and into a world that is obsessed with like numbers and streams and um, and then yoga, you know what it is? Life is supposed to be like about feelings. Mm-hmm. And it's somehow the the world of tech and social media has has made life about um like numbers and 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 what gets these the the eyes attention so it's it's strange it's really it's something yeah. that i've um i of course i i i use it but i i i try to navigate like expectations and and my emotion with it all and you know to to i guess like the work it takes to be good at something or the work it takes to make a movie or it's like none of that even it's like the appreciation of craft and yeah. and uh, and feelings it's strange yeah. those two sort of areas don't seem to matter as much anymore i i believe that that's really true on a lot of on a lot of levels but what does shine so much more now is like a pure pureness hmm. and an authenticity and i think that like when i battle a little a little bit against that of you know like I stopped calling myself a yoga teacher because like come on let's get real you know a few hundred hours of of yoga uh, Mm. a study doesn't make me a teacher I'm simply leading people through flows and and the moment I start saying I'm a teacher it's the moment I'm like no longer a student and that's a little bit of bullshit for me so I don't I don't buy that I don't buy that I am a teacher you know I buy that I can understand the body and understand how to keep people, you know, in a very beneficial flow for themselves for an hour and a half. But I, you know, I went, I'll go, I'll go learn from teachers. Um, but like, I do definitely have moments where I think like, oh, this is, you know, uh, this is so gross now that I just don't even look like, oh, this is really gross. And, you know, searching for Austin in, or excuse me, in Texas, the yoga studios are all, all open. So I'm there every couple of weeks. It's amazing. I can go to Black Swan Yoga and I, have these really great practices, 
But oh my gosh, the moment that 20 something year old teacher, you know, um, starts to say, just let it go, you know, let everything go that does not serve you. I'm like holding back this judgmental vomit because I'm just, you know, like, but that is what you, that's what we are at. That's where we're at right now. Like that is what you feel that you have to say, because that's what, you know, this whole like industry is created. When I have those moments, A, it's me being judgmental. So B, there's the ego involved. So C, that whole practice for me is totally lost on this like really silly human thing that I'm experiencing, which is not why I practice or lead yoga. So it kind of takes me back to like, you know, it's it's basically just me. I don't even need a yoga mat. You know, like this process is super, super personal. It's a very, very personal thing. It's it's not to be, you know, everybody knows me in this kind of world as, you know, a, a, the plant based yoga <laughs> skydiving woman for sure. Like it's that's part of my branding that has happened because I've been practicing it for so long around the world. But like it's just boiled down to me and my personal journey in it. And so whatever I'm seeing online, well, online is just a very, very silly place anyways, mm. but it cannot get in the way of that personal relationship that I have with this thing in so much as my ability to still lead from that place, that really organic, pure, authentic place is so refreshing for people as it would be for you as well. Right. Not that like, Oh no, I'm not um, naked enough to be seen as a cool, you know, female yoga teacher. Like, nah, you just got to get rid of that stuff and actually just make sure that that doesn't seep into your brain because as soon as it does, it's just toxifying your whole, your head, you know, and that's not a good place. So I think, yes, we don't really um, appreciate the craft and the hard work that go into things such as art, music, um, you, you, know, you know, yoga, but what shines through, at least from my experience, are those people that are really authentic that you can feel are more than that numerical value, Hmm. you know, attached to their social media pages that are not, you know, taking an underwear photo on a rock doing a, you know, a backbend, uh, you know, with a, a roomy quote, like they're the real deal. And so the more you seek that out, and the more you do your processes without having that toxic thought of the, the nakedness of Instagram yogis, the more you actually are feeding your own authenticity and pureness in that. And I think that is the process. Yeah. I guess, um, how, yeah, I'll, last thing I was just thinking that I'll let you go. I was just thinking about, like, energy. And it's weird. I've been watching a lot of um, YouTube concerts of like Soundgarden and Alice in Chains and Nirvana. I've just been like watching a lot of them because I used to go to concerts all the time. And, you know, as much as I like to teach Zoom classes, uh, it's, you know, it certainly lacks the energy. And, And like, this is great. I mean, clearly I feel the energy, you know, the smile. But, you know, I I'd like to give you a hug, you know, and be in the same room. And it's weird, like, what, what's your what's your vibe with energy? I mean, it, it, is it like a it's obviously a real thing where I can tell that I'm missing concerts. So I'm watching. I'm trying to, like, feel that energy of a of a live show. I mean, I don't know. I don't even have a question, but I'm just as you're talking, I'm thinking about energy right now. Oh, man, it's probably one of my favorite things. OK, it, it is. It is. It, it's, it's everything. Right. It's, yeah. it's all of it. It's that like you're saying the most important thing about life is feeling. And I'm saying like open up the steams and rip rip the self open to have that big life experience, but that's all energy. And like the the the, the, the energy that we have that's kind of zapped with the, the numerical value online or this energy that we're feeling right now, even though I'm looking at my laptop on top of my TV, I see your voice, but I can still feel you. Like it's energy is everything. And so it's, you know, it's 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 like yes, we're missing it for sure. Um but it's so much available in your space. It's so, so entirely much. I mean, you know, it's finding processes. Like I'm very, very super passionate about like processes that we have in our lives. Like I, I need energy. What is my process for that? You know, it's, it's for me, it's, you know, um, you know, wake up, put on the headphones, put on that 
that, the, that music that really like, wow, I feel so good in some way. And that might be a mantra or it might be like a super stoked, energetic song, whatever it is, but put it on and like feel yourself and like stir it up and get it going. And, you know, step on the mat or, you know, like feel the wind. I mean, like there's so many things that we can do without even leaving our rooms in lockdown to cultivate that energy and keep it moving. And it's really like, you know, I, I, I tease myself with, you know, mostly girlfriends or people when I'm speaking about this, but holy cow, like the self, the process to, to really know myself and love myself and, and just be a total buddy to myself has been of like, you know, I, I just remember like, oh, you know, walking in Spain and like hugging myself, grabbing my arms and getting all giddy and just like, oh, I really love me. And, you know, this feeling and and I did and all of that stuff. Like you can do all of these things, you know, there's, there's nothing that says that we can't just kind of like sit on our living room floor and, you know, be happy and talk to ourselves and tell us why we're feeling really good in that moment and start to stir it up. So I think, you know, I think, this is a really good example of us staring at these laptops, these devices, and I see all these devices in your your studio there, and I've got you know Bluetooth headphones and a remote and a heater remote and a cell phone just next to my laptop, you know. So we're we're here, but you know we're to you know thousands of miles away, I think, and um, and we can feel this energy. That is partially because we're reflecting in each other. I can see your face and this is really fun. I haven't seen you for many years, but it's also because it's just in you Hmm. and you're having your energetic experience right now that you believe it's because we're having this great conversation and we can see each other on Zoom, but it's actually because it's there and it's being stoked right now. And so like, if you're not feeling it, it's all there. You're just not really plugging into it and stirring it and ah, like, <laughs> you know, feeling it, yeah. but it's definitely possible. And, you know, as we move around and we do this thing in our worlds and do our day to day, you can definitely look around and see like, whoop, all right, whoa, that energy is pretty wild, you know, and I'm just gonna leave that one alone and like zip back into my own and just, you know, create this playground this loving kindness sort of energy and and then that's once you've done that for a while that's just it you're just this capsule of like healthy healing loving kindness energy you know energetic and and um and it's quite easy to to be in but i know there wasn't a question there so there wasn't even an answer but yes to energy it's a big 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 thing and the, the, the sooner we can tap into that and the more we can become self-creating and like um, sustaining of our own energy, holy moly, it's just, it is life. It's, it's our human experience with that energy. Yeah, I'm just, <laughs> just processing. You're just like a joy to, to, to talk to and listen to. And I missed, I, I, I've missed you. I, I'm so sorry, I don't know why I haven't reached out but um, I don't know I'm just I'm so happy that I did and I'm so happy that you wanted to talk and Same, um, I don't know I, I, I feel like I want to cry because I just haven't seen you for so long and it's just it was really beautiful. yeah it was really great to see you beautiful it's the same <laughs> thank you very much you look lovely a, a heart feels full yeah love it love it well thanks so much Alethea lots of love it was great to see you and you're really, seriously, you're like really inspiring. It's just your energy is just um, just so uplifting. Just, I, I, this will go live in like probably a week or two, but just thanks so much. This was so great. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you too, Eddie. It was a real pleasure. It's so nice to see you. You and Emmy have always lived in my heart for sure. So it's, it's really nice to see that face and engage with that energy on both sides, my side and your side. It's really yeah. nice. Yeah. Thanks, Eddie. Bye. Bye.